for you. I, I didn't. <laughs> I'm voting after the meeting. Now it is. We're live. On the air. Good morning. I'm calling this meeting to order. We have a quorum. Yes, we do. Welcome, everyone. Pledge of Allegiance now. Judith Troutman. Yes. Just a reminder, if you are a veteran, you have the option to place, uh, instead of placing your hand over your heart, you may salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And the media, we know TV is on. Globe is not here yet. And approval of the agenda. Move. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Approval of the minutes of our last meeting. <coughs> Diane? All second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. The report of the chair. This is a little bittersweet. It's the last meeting of this particular board. We're missing President Tom Circle. He's not here today. And we miss his, co his commitment was to collaboration and teamwork. And we're grateful this board became a strong team under Tom's leadership. Best wishes for Tom in the future. And then also leaving this board is Judith Troutman. Director Troutman is leaving. Judith is a tireless worker in her service to the community. Her talent for attention to detail has been a valuable asset for this board. We will miss Judith and wish her well in the future. Our board members who are continuing service are completing a year filled with many changes and hard work and lots of meetings. Thank you, one and all. Appreciate it. And then there's our staff. They're our action team. And they've performed with great effectiveness and efficiency this year, thanks to them for a wonderful performance, all staff members. Thank you. And a special thank you to Siobhan, jumping up to the plate and working like crazy. Thank you. I am, I am new to this task. And thank you to the board and staff as they provide support and assistance to me as I lead this meeting. When I was um, a school principal, one of the things I would say to my teachers during a staff meeting is, I have a prize for the first person who finds a mistake that I do in this meeting. So I'll say that today. Anybody out there that finds a mistake, just let me know. You're the, if you're the first person, you'll get a prize from me, because trust me, I'll make some mistakes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank well, you. You just made a mistake. You talked too long. I talked too long. <laughs> I get the prize. <laughs> so where we are now is the update from VMS, our director, Lucy Scheiman. Good morning. Uh, this opportunity and task that we get once every three months is a blessing for the VMS board because we get to tell you what the other side thinks. We have the United side, we have the third side, we have the GRF side, and we have the VMS side. Our function is to advise and protect the employees. 
We stand up for them, and we appreciate all that they do. And that's what our function is. We don't want to tell you what to do, although sometimes we wish we could. And we want to listen to what you have to say and what you want and try to affect that if it's reasonable. Certainly present it to the BMS Corporation and let them decide whether or not they can do it. But you don't always work through us. You work more directly. And anyway, today it's my opportunity to introduce to you one of my favorite employees. This is Daniel Slaughter. Stand up. <laughs> Dan is the, what, supervisor of all the pools? Yes, uh, the head pool guy. <laughs> Big undertaking, but it's, I'm usually the one bouncing yep. around from day to day, just checking them twice a day and putting out the fires as, as they arise. Yeah, he's the one who makes water usable. <laughs> he, he comes before and after the classes to make sure nobody contaminated. <laughs> but he's just a charming person. He's very helpful, very friendly, and he's accommodating to the nth degree. So thank you very much, Daniel. For, and thank you for coming because I wanted to express my appreciation. He's not up for gentleman of the month. I've got those people. But uh, he's my favorite person, and he's always there. In fact, I nailed him in the parking lot one day when I couldn't get my car started. It did that thing where the steering wheel locks, and always anybody else can make it start, but I can. <laughs> so he did. Anyway, this is Daniel Slaughter. Please appreciate him. Remember him, and if you're in the at the pool, turn around. At any time in the middle of the day, you'll probably see him. He's also there first thing, cleaning out all the good stuff. And he gets out the leaves and makes sure it's usable for all of us. So thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Anyway, <clears throat> onward and upward. The big event of the month was the appreciation gathering for the recognition of excellence for individuals from all of the different departments. And it, I, I don't mean to have favoritism, and I don't mean to be unfair. The only names you folks will probably know, and probably most of the people in the outside world will be Catherine Laster, who is the executive assistant from the GM's office. She's been here for several years, and she is just an incredible person. And you'll all know the name. I'm sure you've all had reason to deal, deal with her. The other person that's quite well known in the community as an individual is Dan Yost in finance. He's called risk and insurance analyst. But if you ever have any kind of problem or have any money problem, he's the guy you see. So those two are names you'll know. The other people, there's nothing, they're just not people that are known. Um, I think that the only other one people in United would be familiar with is the new handyman service man. His name is Vincent Martinez. And he was honored because He's got nothing but applause from all the people in United <clears throat> whom he has served as the paid for subscribed handyman. Wish we could have that for third. <laughs> the biggest majority of people honored were the whole concrete repair department. They have done such a fantastic job that their supervisor wanted to honor the whole group. And here was this, how many, 10 or 15, 14? And they all came up, and they're all great big husky guys who work very hard and have caught us up. I think uh, Siobhan can tell you later how far behind we were, but we were way behind. 
and we're pretty well caught up. So the goal is to be current. The goal is to say when someone calls or someone to respond immediately, answer the phone quickly, have an answer, take care of it, do the thing that needs to be done. And if you've had personal experience with it in the last year or two years, you'll know it gets done. Everybody can recite something that they saw or heard. Uh, Dick Palmer told me an incident where his downstairs neighbor noticed that her light bulb outside was all covered with cobwebs and, and, and dirt and leaves, and the whole area was terrible. And Dick just mentioned it to Brad. The next day was all taken care of. This is the kind of service that makes people say, wow, we like BMS. And we want you all to like BMS. And the TV audience, please like BMS. We, ha we have a good group going here. We have wonderful employees. We have experts in each of their fields. They were carefully selected. They were encouraged. They were screened. And they turned out to be really great employees. They're taking good care of all of us. So let's keep up the good work. I'm interested to see what Siobhan can tell us what's happening in the prospects of a new leader. But uh, we'll see. Also, the other thing that they wanted me to speak about was, I'm looking to see if my time's on yet, uh, the job openings that we have. There are job openings listed online. There are some temporary, or I'm sorry, part-time jobs that are available. Bus drivers, uh, I think there's still some that are uh, uh, gate ambassadors and dispatchers and people for fitness. So read the online app, uh, job, uh, job needs. You know, let's see if I can see where the slide down here. Uh, anyway, they are open, open jobs that part time and full time for other people. There are supposed to be some kind of rewards to a resident or one of you who is able to refer somebody that gets hired and stays on the job for a period of time. So it's, it's an opportunity to get somebody good in, somebody you know. Because some of these jobs we're hiring young people from, people from college and that sort of thing. And a trainer who's fresh out of football or something. <laughs> Anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry, last time it was my turn. Nobody told me, and I didn't come. But uh, I hope we continue to be as good an organization as we've been. I hope that we're able to keep your expectations fulfilled to make it better, or at least not any worse, uh, than it is now. We're trying very hard to please all of the 18,000 roughly people who live here. So keep trying and see you in three months. Thank you, Lucy. Next, we have our CEO report, Siobhan Foster. Honorable President, thank you, members of the board. I'm pleased to provide the CEO update this morning, and I wanted to start with a reminder that today is election day. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., and to find your polling place, you can look at the, on the back of your county voter information guide that was mailed to all voters, or you can visit voterstatus.sos.ca.gov to find your polling place online. There's also the Secretary of State's voter hotline that people can call to find their, their polling places. And that number is 800-345-8683. And just a reminder on your vote by mail ballots, 
They must be postmarked today and received by the county within three uh, days of the election. Or they can be dropped off this evening until 8 p.m. at any uh, balloting location. I also want to announce the veteran celebration that will occur this Sunday morning, November 11th at 10 a.m. at Clubhouse 2. This is the village's tribute to all who have served in our armed forces. And the guest speakers on Sunday will include Korean War veteran Peter Chong, members of the 1st Marine Regiment of Camp Pendleton, and Mayor Carol Moore. So we hope everyone comes out to celebrate our veterans on Sunday morning. Monday, November 12th, is the observed holiday of Veterans Day this year. I would like to go over the holiday hours that we have. Resident Services Call Center will be open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. by calling 949-597-4600. The walk-in uh, services, however, will be closed on that day in Resident Services. In the Community Center, the Recreation Office, PC Learning Center, and Mac Learning Center will be closed. The Fitness Center and Table Tennis Room will be open from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's a modified schedule. And for transportation services, the only scheduled service will be plan a ride. And participants are reminded to schedule their trips two days prior to the holiday. I have an update on the paddle tennis and pickleball courts project. This Saturday, November 10th, from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., the post-tensioned reinforced concrete slab will be poured. This is exciting because this will result in an uninterrupted perfectly flat surface with no construction joints for all those who use the courts. Construction activities are being planned to minimize disruption to parking at gate 12. Concrete is going to be poured from Molten Parkway to the courts. An entire traffic lane on Molten will be closed for this activity. Few parking spaces uh, near the courts will be temporarily used for loading and unloading equipment, but other than that, parking should be intact at gate 12. We do encourage residents to stay clear of the construction activities um, on Saturday as they occur. We also have the HVAC project at the community center starting uh, on Saturday. So it's from Saturday at 6 a.m. to 1 p.m., the parking on the north side of the building here at the community center will be restricted. And what is happening is that the HVAC contractor will be staging a large crane to lift some equipment onto the roof. So we have to close the north side of the parking lot to ensure the safety of that activity. The remainder of the project will occur in 2019, and that work is going to be done on evenings and weekends, so not to impact the community center and the services that we offer. But so bear with us on the Saturday as that crane is lifting equipment onto the roof. Pool five closed yesterday for routine maintenance. So I just want to go over the uh, pool availability for our audience. Pool six is also closed for the winter season. So until further notice, the following pools are available for use. Pool one from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. And Tuesdays it opens at 9 a.m. Pool 2 is available from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. with a late opening on Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. And Pool 4 is available from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. with a late opening on Fridays at 9 a.m. In closing, I want to thank the VMS staff who have been performing at a high level since our former CEO Brad Hudson has left. The experience and professionalism of our directors and department heads coupled with our committed staff have performed super superbly since Brad's departure. We've uh, weathered the transition well and have had a very productive month. Um, some highlights very briefly include the relocation of manor alterations to the first floor of the community center. This is exciting because it provides a very enhanced customer service to those 1,200 visitors per month that we average in manor alterations. There's now ample room for residents to come in and lay out their plans and go over them with a counter technician. There are shorter wait times, and Manor Alterations is now accepting appointments by telephone. So you can schedule your time, come in, and take care of business. You may have also seen the construction activity in social services. 
and this is to add additional office space to that area. Three new employees have been added to social services at minimal cost to our community. This includes two master level uh, social work interns who started in September, and one social worker will begin later this month through collaboration and funding from Memorial Care Saddleback Medical Center. So we've made a great augmentation to staff without cost to our community. I also wanted to mention two other projects that were recently completed. One is the new passive park that's now open where the shuffleboard courts were adjacent to Clubhouse 2. This is an open area now. You can come and relax, hang out, read a book, and enjoy one of the best views of the uh, village. And also, RV Lot A opened three weeks ahead of schedule. That was closed for concrete and asphalt repair. And once we heard that there was concern about the vehicles parked in the community, uh, the MNC department expedited the schedule and got the work done three weeks ahead of time. So we're very proud of that as well. So that concludes my presentation this morning. Thank you, Siobhan. So next we have open forum. At this time, the speakers may address the board of directors regarding items not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board of directors of the Golden Rain Foundation. There's a maximum time limit of three minutes per speaker and a speaker may only address the board once during this period. The board reserves the right to limit the total amount of time allotted for the, for the open forum. Whitney. Chris Collins. Welcome, Chris. Good morning. Chris Collins, 3306Q. I'm here representing the foundation of Laguna Woods Village. What would you do if you experienced a financial crisis and could not afford to pay your electric bill? If you ran out of money and only had food to last the week? If you suddenly suffered a loss of vision and could not afford to purchase a magnifier or a cane? If your spouse was experiencing increased forgetfulness or dementia, but you couldn't afford a caregiver. If you were in the donut hole and your doctor prescribed an expensive medication. If you were released from the hospital and needed a caregiver services that you couldn't afford or needed meals on wheels. Or if you could no longer drive and needed help with transportation, but your funds were limited. Well, the very first step, of course, would be to contact social services at 949-597-4267. But in addition, the Laguna Woods Village, in Laguna Woods Village, these difficulties can be handled because the foundation stands ready to help residents in, this temp in their temporary financial assistance, which can, buy, can help buy food, pay for utilities, transportation, purchase medication, arrange for caregiver services, among other things. So by contacting social services, their staff will verify the need and arrange for assistance. During this process, and, and um, um, the social workers there will verify all of this, and if a need is determined, payment is made directly to the vendor by the foundation. So now for Meals on Wheels, you can contact AgeWell Senior Services at 949-380-0155. Um, in turn, found, uh, uh, the foundation financial assistance is also available to needy residents who have uh, vision problems by contacting the Braille Institute at 949-330-5062. Uh, foundation financial assistance for daycare services um, can be available through, um, if the residents have dementia or Alzheimer's, it's available by contacting South County uh, Adult Services, which is at 949-855-944. So for information, please contact the foundation at the foundation at comline.com or 949-268-2246. Thank you so much. Patricia Chapman.
Welcome, Patricia. Thank you, and, and thank you for letting me come and speak. I have a small problem. It may not seem like much to you, but I have a caregiver who drives to my place two or three times a week. And because she has an electric car, she needs to have some place to park her car where she can get it charged so she can go home. <clears throat> She's been coming over here and parking either at the hotel or on the place back here. But because she uh, works for me I can, and I drive a golf cart, I can't see why she can't park where I park my golf cart, which has a charger. She has, you know, she has to come in every day and just stay and park her car in the parking area outside. But I think she should be able to park where I park and I can move my golf cart out so she can get in and use my, my uh, charger. But one of my neighbors used to be in security, and he said she can't do that. She has to have permission. So I'm asking for permission for my caregiver to be able to park where uh, I do so she can get her, got her car charged so she can go home. I'm wondering if that would be possible, and I'm asking for your permission to uh, allow her to do that. And I don't know if she needs a special sticker on her car or whatever, but I'm asking if you would be able to allow her to do that. Can I ask which mutual you live in? Pardon? May I ask which mutual? Do you live in United or Third? I don't know what you said. What you, where do you live? Man or number? What mutual do you live in? Oh, 73C. I don't know which Pardon? You are in United. United. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. We'll, we'll be answering after all the speakers okay. will Thank answer. You. Thank you. Esther Wright. So first of all, I want to thank the directors um, who are leaving the this board and for your service and your time and energy that you've given to this community. This is such a wonderful community to live in, as you know, because you live here. And I am the, the uh, co-chair of the Non-Toxic Laguna Woods uh, project. And I wanted to give you an update about what's happening with that project. First of all, some of you may already know that in the summer, we collected in two weeks more than 1,800 signatures from owners in Third Mutual and United stating that they requested the, actually demanded, the immediate suspension of Roundup. I'm pleased to say that Third Mutual uh, listened and responded to their uh, constituents by immediately deciding to end Roundup in Third Mutual. So that is no longer an issue in Third Mutual. However, um, United decided to do a 100-day experiment where they would stop using Roundup uh, in five of the cul-de-sacs and continue using Roundup in other places around the community. Well, I wanted to let you know that last Monday, a week ago Monday, uh, the non-toxic Laguna Woods community group uh, called a meeting. And we didn't have a lot of publicity, but I want you to realize that we had a standing room only crowd that showed up. I have photos of that group. It was amazing how many people came out of their concern about their health and well-being and out of their concern about the fact that Roundup is still being used throughout this community. We had as our speaker, Bob Johnson, who was one of the men or people who spearheaded the um, non-toxic Irvine project. And he has a lot of information about the alternatives to Roundup. And one of the things that we've heard here is that we aren't quite sure that there are effective alternatives to Roundup so that we can keep our community beautiful, keep our landscaping pristine. Well, as it turns out, Irvine for, for several months, almost a year now, has been using these alternatives and they're working just fine. So we're hoping, assuming that Bruce Hartley, the landscape supervisor, is staying in touch with the people in Irvine to find out what they've already learned. We don't need to experiment in five cul-de-sacs. We have the information if we seek it, if we ask for it, and that will take care of it. I want you to know that um, there are people in this community that are starting to get very upset. I'm trying to be patient and appreciate that things take time to change. 
But I want you to know that we have hundreds of dog owners who are spending $100 a month for drugs and medicine to keep their dogs from having skin inflammations and infections from the effect of Roundup on their paws. We know that there are more and more dog owners that are asking the uh, Homeowners Association to reimburse them for the cost of these drugs that they're taking because some of them have notes from their vets saying this is a direct cause of the chemicals in the grass. I also heard a woman uh, who I happen to know who has lymphoma tell me that she is going to get tested for glyph glyphosate, glyphosate because she has heard that lymphoma is caused by exposure to glyphosate. And I'm very concerned about the liability issues that this community is going to be facing if we don't do something as soon as possible about this whole issue. Thank you so much. Lois Rubin. Hi, 5509B. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for caring about this community, for your fine work. And especially want to thank you in advance for your concern to do the right thing, to create motions here that will affect the community assets and the exposure that we all have to not only Roundup, but other pesticides, the outgassing of them, the exposure to them. And yes, the pets are suffering. However, I'm a certified health and wellness coach as well as a mental health licensed professional. And I want you to know that nearly a day goes by that I do not receive either a phone call or an email from some concerned resident who has been really health compromised with serious forms of cancer, lymphoma, nervous system disorders. There is a high increase in Parkinson's. Bert Maldo, I want to thank you for being open to receiving my emails of the scientific studies and the information that's available. I also want to say, in addition to Esther, I'm also co-chair of the Non-Toxic Laguna Woods Project. And I'm happy to report that we had probably close to 100 people attend our meeting a week ago Monday. They were and are very concerned. And as Esther pointed out, Esther and I are calming down the residents who are ready to pursue litigation. We are very concerned about this. We are not endorsing that uh, procedure or behavior. Also, it is known, not only non-toxic Irvine, these folks have been a blessing to us. They have volunteered their time to support us and to coach us in what is necessary to proceed. We also understand that things take time. However, it is a proven recipe in six cities in the state of California. They know what non-toxic pesticide alternatives work. Why are we dragging our feet here? We need some answers. There is a pr communication problem between the director of services and getting the information that we know what works. We don't need any more experiments. We need to utilize what works, and we need to do it immediately to protect the health and the well-being of all of us. Thank you very much. Cash Akrakar. Welcome, Cash. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have an excellent community here. And as a result, we have people of top experiences, good experiences, businessmen, doctors, lawyers, engineers, directors, all of them moving here after their retirement. Some of them, not all of them, still want or have a desire to go out and contribute to our society. A gr small group right now is thinking about starting another club to use these senior brains to take product to final product, uh, idea to a product, to make teams that can be utilized for the outside local companies 
uh, on small project basis and start a foundation. Yeah. It's an idea, yeah, but it cannot be done by a small group. That's why I'm here to canvas to get more people, retirees who want to <clears throat> contribute their time and formalize this system to um, make as a senior brain foundation or something of that sort, and Laguna Woods being the starting chapter. And I'm taking the lead in this, and starting next year, uh, I would like some show of hands and participation. I think if we just sit and not participate, uh, Communities don't work, and our communities have sustained this long, primarily because of volunteers who contribute their time, their energy, their expertise and knowledge. And right now we have uh, clubhouses, we have swimming pools, we have tennis courts, but we do not have anything to use the brain power that we may be able to contribute to some local um, advantage, uh, something that can be still tapped. Not every one of us is strictly retired and ready to go to the next level. You know what I mean, up there or down there. Thank you very much. So please contact me. My email is cash334 at gmail.com and my phone number 949-217 one nine five zero. Thank you. And you did an excellent speech today. I liked it. Thank thank you. Pat English. Welcome, Pat. Good morning, everyone. Two oh two two D via Mariposa. I'm here this morning just to address a rumor because I think you people may be able to dispel this rumor. This rumor, I'm afraid, if it's true, in my opinion, will have some very negative effects on Laguna Woods Village. What is the rumor? The rumor is that we're going to be putting the transfer fee up to $10,000. Now, for those of you who have Look, excuse me, Pat, number of Pat sale. would you repeat that again? We're all saying, what? The repeat rumor that is that GRF are going, is going to put the transfer fee up to $10,000 from the current $5,000. Now, I sincerely hope this is not true, but for the benefit of the real estate industry in this area, I hope you will dispel these rumors because, in my opinion, if you did that, our sales would go way down. They have already gone way down recently. Thank you very much. Maxine McIntosh. Welcome, Maxine. Thank you. You're doing a beautiful job, Beth. I've been watching closely. I can't find a mistake yet. <laughs> we'll share the prize. I understand our 27 corporate members are planning to clarify the GRF bylaw 2.1.4 during the meeting next Wednesday. I remember that the original intent of this GRF bylaw was to require, that, require the larger vote of the 27 corporate members to approve any GRF project expected to cost $1.5 million or more or much more. I, I, I agree that's very responsible. I've not found an open meeting where community members can listen to and add ideas or question any part of the coming resolution. I'm very sorry about that. How may I at least obtain a copy of the new resolution that will be proposed on Wednesday for my reading Wednesday of next, next week? before my reading, uh, before that meeting for my personal reading. I am addressing this board, as I know you've had 
perhaps as much input on the proposed bylaw changes as the corporate members, even though this board will not be voting on, Wednesday, on that Wednesday. I realize that. I think it's most responsible that only the 27 directors of all our housing mutuals are the corporate members. After all, our mutual boards are responsible for regulating our monthly assessments. They are the only ones who determine how much money they require of us to finance our village. I pray the corporate members make no exceptions on Wednesday of next week. A possible future renovation of this room, a renovation of Clubhouse 3, any other big project should not be exceptions. They should require a corporate member's vote. Thank you. There are no more speakers. No more speakers. Thank you. Um, I know that I have board members here ready to answer some. Um, would you like to be first, Bert? First to answer, Patricia. Patricia, I own two electric vehicles. Uh, I happen to have a garage, so I plug in my electric vehicles in the garage, and I have to pay that electric bill. And here is the problem, basically, that, that is being faced, okay? We have to recover the cost of the electricity that's being used. And right now, as far as I know, we have no provision for doing that for outsiders. The only way that they can charge their cars is, is through using the charging bollards uh, in the community or elsewhere around the community where they pay for the electricity. So I guess until we either consider some alternative means of charging where we would allow an outsider to come in and plug in, uh, or as I say, uh, they certainly can plug into the bollard that we have behind this building. But that's, that's our only alternative right now. The uh, Energy Task Force is currently working on looking to expand charging stations within the village. Okay, but nothing is, is firmed up yet. Um, with regard to the uh, toxic, toxic uh, spray, um, I'm just curious. There was a meeting, and you had a guest speaker. Was Bruce, Bruce Hartley invited? Because if he was not invited, that was a terrible mistake. He should have been there. Um, he has been attempting to contact Irvine, the people who are there. Uh, I've talked to him about it. He says they don't call him back. So um, this, this is about a week ago that I talked to him about this. He may have made contact since then. May I respond? Yes. Thank you. No, no, no. no it's oh, not a, okay. I no. have different information for, from the non talk Okay. The other thing that I want to make these dog lovers aware of is that this chemical is in the dog food. There have been articles to that effect. And if you're feeding your dog dog food every day, this is probably more harmful to those dogs than the spray on the lawns. But I don't discount the harmfulness of the spray as well. Thank you. Are there any others that would like to speak to this issue, this tox toxin issue? Any other board members or Siobhan, anybody else want to say something on that? Just that the next United Landscape meeting where this will be discussed is December 13th. December 13th. Thank you. The lady is hard of hearing. Make sure she understands what's being said. Please. Okay, um, anyone else want to respond to anybody? Diane. Uh, yeah, I just had uh, to, to Pat, um, we have absolutely had, we have had no discussions about increasing the trust facilities fee. Um, I don't see it on the horizon. It's not something that's talked about in private or under anybody's breath. There has never been any conversation that I've ever heard of or um, about raising the fee uh, at all. So, uh, and uh, regarding what Maxine was asking for, I just went on the team up calendar and I found the, uh, a copy of the new bylaws under the uh, 
the annual meeting of the corporate members that's next week. So if you just go there, I, I don't know where else you can get a copy, but I know you can get a copy of the revised bylaw there. And I think that's an open meeting, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, Well, I think it just yeah, Bert, I think we need to talk about this roundup thing. And, you know, we have a new landscape committee, so put it on that. That's on the agenda. Okay. And uh, can I just cash? Okay. Um, this is for Patricia Chapman about the caregiver parking in United since she's in 73C. She also needs to go to a United uh, meeting, the caregiver and everything else, and bring this issue up with them. Okay, but I did make note of this in terms of for the future. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I just want to comment with, with what Cash had, had to say and, and the organization he's trying to put together. We have tried over and over again to make people in this community aware that if you have a skill, that we would invite you to attend the committees that could certainly use that skill. I mean, we are always looking for people who can be advisors to our committee. And, you know, I, I would say let's start there first. Thank you, Bert. That's true. We're always looking for advisors for our committees. And so now we will go to our director, Ray Gross. In the past, we're going to do something different now. This is not on the agenda, but in the past, Members of the board have been involved with the Laguna Canyon Foundation as directors. I have been a director there for many, many, many years. And what we would do is report at each meeting if we had a challenge, for instance, with fires or with flood situations or animals, this, and that, and the other, that was always reported. We haven't been doing this. It's been three years now where we're no longer that the committees are no longer, or the board members are no longer part of the director for Laguna Canyon. However, I am still involved. I supply each month the Laguna Canyon Foundation uh, paperwork to show you what's going on. But I'd like to give you kind of an overview of what's going. Laguna Canyon Foundation, in the 1980s, the Irvine Company set forth a plan to develop what was known as Laguna Laurel Parcel with over 3,200 housing units, golf courses, a fire station, commercial shopping centers, and a school. The community surrounding Laguna Beach banded together to support a movement to protect the open space. And that's really important because when we had flood conditions, we thought we could just stop the water going through our, our, our little uh, channel here. The Laguna Canyon is involved in it, and Laguna Beach is involved in it, and we were physically sued because of certain things we did that were illegal. So these are the things that used to be brought forth. Laguna Canyon Foundation was formed in 1990 with the specific purpose of preserving a couple of thousand acres. Fast forward almost 30 years. There are now more than 22,000 acres of preserved open space in the South, South Coast Wilderness, Laguna Canyon Foundation continues its mission of preserving and protecting the open space with implemented programs that steward the land and educate park users, which is made possibly by private donations from people like you. Laguna Canyon Foundation offers a host of opportunities to get involved. Guided activities, everything from bird walking, geological hikes to yoga hikes, they are free, just RSVP online by visiting, and I'll repeat this, lagunacanyon.org slash events, volunteer events. Help restore the rare coastal sage scrub habitat by helping us gather and propagate seeds, grow native plants in our nursery, and eventually plant them into our natural habitat. Sign up by visiting lagunacanyon.org slash volunteer. Sign up for our monthly email newsletter by signing up on the same lagunacanyon.org. Donate to Laguna Canyon Foundation at lagunacanyon.org donate. Your support will help bring thousands of underprivileged school children into the open space for educational field trips. Restore hundreds of acres of critical habitat that's home to endangered and threatened species. Build and maintain miles of trails. Run a robust 
volunteer program offering countless opportunities to the communities surrounding Laguna Canyon and help protect the canyon you love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Ray typically gives his report on Laguna Canyon Foundation at the end of our committee reports, and all of you are usually home enjoying a cup of tea at that time. Yeah, so it, it, so yeah. we really wanted to have you have an opportunity to hear about Laguna Canyon. Yeah, Thank in you addition, so much. sometimes you don't get the full TV. If it's after, say, 12.30, you don't get my report or some of the other reports. So that's why we asked to have it done this time. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on now to number 12, unfinished business, 12A. Do I have to read that? Okay. Resolution, sorry. Resolution 9018XX, trust facilities fee policy. Whereas as trustee of the Golden Rain Foundation Trust, the board of directors of the Golden Rain Foundation is required to maintain and improve <coughs> the recreational and other amenities available to all residents of Laguna Woods Village. And whereas the board of directors finds that reinstatement of the capital contribution to the trust originally required to be made for each manor sold will ensure the continuation of the amenities that make Laguna Woods <coughs> Village unique. Now, therefore, be it resolved, November 6, 2018, that as trustee of the Golden Rain Foundation Trust, a declaration of trust recorded March 6, 1964, the board will impose a fee to be known as the trust facilities fee in accordance with all terms and conditions contained in this policy statement and in California Civil Code 4580 as amended by Senate Bill 1128, Stats 2010, Chapter 322, Paragraph 2, effective January 1, 2011, on all transactions involving the purchase of a separate interest in any of the trustors' common interest developments, that is, United Laguna Hills, I'm sorry, United Laguna Woods Mutual, Third Laguna Hills Mutual, and Mutual 50 each of which is hereafter referred to as a trustor within the city of Laguna Woods as an obligation of the purchase, purchaser. So effective January 1st, 2019, for purposes of determining the effective date, purchase contracts entered prior to January 1st, 2019, in which escrow opens before January 1st, 2019, and closes on or before March 31st, 2019, are deemed transactions occurring prior to the effective date. And resolved further, the trust facilities fee will be a fixed amount as, herein, as provided herein and as determined from time to time by the trustee of the Golden Rain Foundation trust. The entirety of each such fee, when and as paid by the purchaser, shall be deposited into the trust facilities fee fund and shall be applicable to all such transactions, excluding the following transfers of a separate interest. One, where ownership of a separate interest is joined between a current beneficiary of a trust or and a non-beneficiary trust spouse, domestic partner, or other relative of such beneficiary. Two, where ownership of a separate interest is transferred to a non-beneficiary of a trustor by gift or through inheritance from a beneficiary of a trustor. Three, where ownership of a separate interest is transferred by a beneficiary of a trustor to the current qualifying resident as defined in the bylaws of each trustor of the separate interest, where the transferor has never been a qualifying resident and has previously paid a trust facilities fee. Or four, where ownership of a separate interest is being transferred to a trust whose settler or principal beneficiary is the transferor or to another trust for estate 
planning purposes. Resolve further effective with escrows opened or purchase contracts signed on or after January 1st, 2018, the trust facilities fee shall be set at $5,000 for units with a sales price of $75,000 or higher and $2,500 for units that sell below $75,000 until modified by the trustee. And resolve further, in accordance with California Civil Code 4580, each new purchase of a separate interest in any of the trustor's common interest developments within the city of Laguna Woods to which this trust facilities fee applies, that is, all new purchases other than a transfer qualifying for any of the exclusions set forth in subparagraphs one through four above, shall, in compliance with the California Code 4580, have the option to either, one, pay the fee in its entirety at the time of transfer, or two, pay the fee amount pursuant to an installment payment plan for a period of seven years. If the purchaser elects to pay the fee in installment payments under the second of the above statutorily permitted options, then the trustee may also collect additional amounts not to exceed the actual costs for billing and financing on the amount owed as set forth below and in compliance with the Davis-Sterling Act as the same may be amended from time to time. And if the purchaser sells their separate interest prior to the end of the installment payment plan period, he or she shall pay the remaining balance of the fee owed to the trustee prior to transfer. A fee of $10 will be imposed for any late payments. <coughs> the Golden Rain Foundation <coughs> shall assess a one-time non-refundable origination fee of $300 for the preparation of the promissory note and related records. The Golden Rain Foundation shall also assess interest not to exceed the maximum rate allowed by law. The payer of the note may prepay the note in whole prior to maturity date without penalty and may receive at the request of the payer evidence of debt fulfillment. Payments received in excess of monthly note installment shall be applied to future note installments and not a direct reduction of the principal. The monthly payment of the trust facilities fee, the origination fee and interest shall be due on the first day of each month and resolve further that resolution 90-1735 adopted November 7th of 2017 is hereby superseded and canceled and resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move that we accept this resolution uh, and the 30 day notice has been satisfied. So this is the final vote. Second. I just want to say that even though you read the entire thing, really it's the end, the last paragraph that changed. We just, um, there was a, a resident brought to our attention that there was some confusion about the way the note's written and the, um, our, our policies. So we went ahead and just cleaned them up. And it, again, this does not Im impact the amount of the fee. It is the same as it was before. Anybody else? The only thing, sorry. The only thing you want to notice is the $300 fee for the preparation of a promissory note. And also that for the promissory note, it's seven years. Those are two things that we just need to make sure everybody knows. Right, but before it was $252, I think, and now it's 300, and the seven years is per statute. Okay, good. So, we're, so we will be voting on the motion, but before we do, 
everyone has a stylist. This is a new thing for us. And so um, and we vote on our tablets, and you may just um, use the stylus to vote. So um, let's do it. Let's vote. Whitney, my screen is not up. To Touch it. it. Just hit it with that oh. thing you got in your hand. Oh, just hit it with this. Hit it okay. On the other hit side. It. Oh, come on. Hit it at the top. There you go. <laughs> Nothing. Push it hard. You have to touch the screen. Push it hard. Just touch the screen, lower left corner. We're, we're all learning with the stylus. <laughs> there you go. You just pop back on. It just takes it and then in the middle, it's got yes or no. It's kind of hard to show the register. Eight. Yours is, I don't know what you. He's back to the, the, the blue screen. Richard's doesn't work. So I think it's just not on. We don't have Dick. You have to kind of hit it hard, Jim. Just tap it. Use this. There. <laughs> Nine. See, it, it'll show a circle when you tap it. It shows a circle around okay. yes. He's voted. He's on. Dick Palmer is not. Dick Palmer. Thank you. Motion passes. <coughs> now we're moving to 12B. Entertain a motion to approve the commercial vehicle storage fee at RV lot. Joan. Resolution 9018XX, commercial vehicles in <coughs> RV lots. Whereas Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods has administration control of <coughs> recreational vehicles, lot A and B, and these spaces have been rented to residents. Whereas the Security and Community Access Committee has recognized the need to find parking for commercial vehicles. Now, therefore, be it resolved on September 4th, 2018, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby allows open RV parking, sorry, open RV lot parking that mm, avail, uh, available, oh, sorry, the real wording, excuse me. Allows open RV lot parking that are available can be utilized by resident commercial vehicles as space permits for $640 per space year. That needs to be reworded. The yeah, parking spaces, it should should read. Yeah. Open RV lot parking spaces. Okay. Resolve further, residents will be given a 30-day notice if required to vacate their commercial vehicle space in order to accommodate a new resident's RV. Resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. Okay, with a couple of corrections, I move. I move we accept this resolution, but I believe the date is wrong. Shouldn't it be November 6th? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So it should be November 6th under the therefore be it resolved. This is a Scribner's. And, and then the word spaces after parking. Okay, parking spaces. With those corrections, <laughs> I move that we accept this resolution. I'll second. Okay, vote seconded. <clears throat> Discussion? 
Judith. I have a, a question to clarify the first resolved further. Residents will be given a 30-day notice if required to vacate their commercial vehicle space in order to accommodate a new resident's RV. So if they have a resident has a commercial vehicle in a space, but then someone with an RV moves in, the commercial vehicle has to vacate. After, and so they have to find some other place to put their car. That's so it's understand. like on space available type of terms. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Bert. Um, the way it is worded, a new resident's RV, at least the fact that I might already be a resident and have gone out and bought an RV. So that, that's... <laughs> your interpretation. Yeah. It's a new yeah, RV. A new RV. It's a new RV, right. not a new resident's RV. Right. Yes. Maybe you should take out residence. Yeah. Just take out that word, residence. Yes, <laughs> then what if it's used, right? What if it's a used RV? <laughs> oh, guys. It's a new RV. Oh. Okay. How, how Diane. If, I was going to say, what if we just take out new and say a resident's RV? Because it has to be a resident. How's that? Yes. Yeah, that oh, that's point. better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so eliminate new, but leave residents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Look at and uh, Judith used a good word for this. It's space available for the commercial vehicles to be able to park in our RV lot. That's what this is all about. Any more discussion? No. Then let's vote. Once again, using this little magic key. Okay. Unanimous here. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have 12C, entertain a motion to introduce a resolution for Clubhouse 2 Logia and Sequoia Ballroom Rental. 12C. Resolution 9018XX, Clubhouse 2 Logia and Sequoia Room Ballroom Rental. Whereas the Palo Verde Loggia, that's patio, and Sequoia Ballroom are rented as two different spaces since renovations were completed in 2017. And whereas the loggia includes a barbecue counter and small sink for, preparation, for food preparation, patio tables, chairs, and sofas. And whereas staff frequently encounters logistical issues and user complaints with separate bookings of the ballroom and patio. And now, therefore, be it resolved, November 6, 2018, that the board of directors of this corporation hereby approves the Palo Verde Loggia at Clubhouse 2 to be included with the rental of the Sequoia Ballroom without an additional fee, eliminating the option for separate rental of the patio. Resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move that we accept this resolution. I second. Second. Discussion. Hearing none. This just seemed like a logical a logical decision to make because if you have a, a serious happening, a memorial or something inside of the Koya Ballroom and outside there's a rock band on the patio, it just didn't work. And so this is our way of solving that problem. Judith. I'll just add some history. The reason we didn't do this in the beginning is we wanted to see, we weren't sure how the residents were actually going to use the two spaces. So it was like a trial period because we knew we could always come back and change it if that first scenario wasn't panning out. And what Beth says is true, if you're having um, a function in one space, it does interfere with the function in another space. So that was just sort of a test period, and we're seeing, we, you know, we're taking our options to change it like we thought. Thank you. Diane. 
I was just going to add that this now is consistent with the other clubhouses that have patios. Yeah, that's true. Anybody else? Okay, then let's vote. It's unanimous. Good. Something's wrong. This is getting to be too easy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got to okay, so um, we are on 12D. Entertain a motion to introduce a resolution for summer kids swim permanent relocation to pool six. Resolution 90-18-XX. Summer kids swim permanent relocation to pool six. Whereas Clubhouse 2 pool is the designated kids pool with limited hours from noon to 2 p.m. daily during the non-summer season, and whereas residents consistently expressed concern that the kids were interfering with their exercise programs and or overall facility enjoyment, and whereas on January 11th, 2018 and February 6, 2018 respectively, the CAC and GRF board approved the relocation of the Summer Kids Swim Program to Pool 6 on a trial basis. And whereas Clubhouse 6 pool had been the least utilized pool, averaging 10 swimmers per day during the summer, and due to low utilization, the pool is only open during the summer months and closed the remainder of the year. Now, therefore, be it resolved November 6, 2018, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves Pool 6 as the permanent location for the Summer Kids Swim Program, with the daily hours being noon till 4 p.m., Memorial Day weekend through the seasonal closure of Pool 6, and resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we approve this resolution. I have a second. Diane. Discussion. Let's go ahead. No discussion. Then we're going to vote. Wow. We're on a roll. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone. Now we are on to new business. 13A, entertain a motion to approve reappointment of GRF representative to the VMS board. And Resolution 9018 XXX, reappointment to Village Management Services, Inc., Board of Directors. Whereas section 2.6 of the VMS bylaws identifies GRF as a member of VMS, and whereas at the end of the 2018 term, GRF will have one vacant position on the Village Management Services, Inc. Board of Directors, and whereas section 4.3 of the VMS bylaws governs the appointment and term of office of the VMS Board of Directors, and whereas VMS directors shall be appointed by the members acting through their respective boards of directors in the same month as the members' annual meeting, and whereas the GRF annual meeting of corporate members will be held on November 14, 2018, whereas any person serving as a VMS director may be reappointed, and there shall be no limitation on the number of terms which a director may serve except that no director may serve more than two consecutive three-year terms, and whereas Lisa Bender was appointed by GRF to the VMS Board of Directors and is completing a two-year term running from 2016 to 2018, and whereas 2016 to 2018 term was Lisa Bender's first on the VMS Board, and whereas VMS Director Bender has expressed a willingness to accept the reappointment to the VMS Board for a three-year term for the period of 2018 to 2021, 
And now, therefore, be it resolved, November 6, 2018, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves the reappointment of Lisa Bender to the VMS Board of Directors for a three-year term running from 2018 through 2021 in accordance with the requirements of the VMS bylaws and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. Second. Dick seconded. Discussion. Okay. Discussion. Judith. Um, the only thing I wanted to say, um, I wanted to explain to the residents why I'm probably the only one that's going to vote against the resolution. I spoke on this at length before, so I'm not going to do that at this time. But I felt that any director position in the village should be open to all potential applicants. And taking away this option um, removes that ability for um, someone else to apply. And that was my only reason. Thank you. will now vote. Yes, motion passes. Thank you. 13B, entertain a motion to approve declaring the slate of candidates for the Office of Golden Rain Foundation Director <coughs> elected. Resolution 9018XX, declaring the slate of candidates for the Office of Golden Rain Foundation Director elected. Whereas, following the close of the 2018 term, there will be three vacant seats on the GRF Board of Directors to be filled. And whereas vacancies on the board shall be filled by GRF's annual meeting, bylaw 8.3.7, and whereas GRF's annual meeting is held the second Wednesday in November, bylaw 5.2, and whereas the second Wednesday of the current year is November 14th, 2018, and whereas nominations for the Office of GRF Director close 50 days before the annual meeting, by law 8.3.5, and whereas the 50th day prior to November 14th, 2018, and therefore the close of nominations for the present year uh, was September 25th, 2018, and whereas as of September 25th, 2018, and following the nomination procedure set forth in bylaw 8.4, only three qualified candidates had been nominated. And whereas bylaw 8.5.1 anticipates an election where the number of nomination, nominees exceeds the number of vacant seats. And whereas following the close of nominations where the number of qualified candidates does not exceed the number of vacancies, those qualified nominees shall be declared elected by law 8.5.2. And whereas civil code section 5115 mandates director elections pursuant to the double secret ballot procedure, and whereas civil code section 5100D exempts from the election procedure mandated by section 5115, where votes are cast by elected representatives, and whereas in accordance with bylaw 5.8.2, votes at director elections are cast by elected representatives the directors of each of the housing mutuals, and whereas bylaw 8.5.2 is supported by Corporations Code 7522D, which states that corporations may, without further action, declare qualified nominees elected, where following the close, the close of nominations, the number of nominees does not exceed the number of vacancies. And whereas eliminating the need for a director election saves the copying and postage expense associated with the distribution of ballots, plus the approximately $1,000 traditionally paid 
to a third party vendor to serve as GRF's inspector of elections. Now, therefore, be it resolved November 6, 2018, that the three qualified nominees arising from the 2018 nomination procedure are hereby declared elected by the GRF Board of Directors and further resolved that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. Diane. Second. Discussion. No discussion. I would like to say something. I'm one of the three, so I just need to let you know that this is such a wonderful place to live. And so many, so many folks in this community do volunteer. Would you please consider running for one of the boards? We're finding that we have just a slim number of people that run for the boards, and it's good to have that kind of competition, and um, it's stimulating, So, and good to have new faces. So please consider, consider next time a board opening comes up at one of the housing mutuals or, or GRF, please consider running for that position. Thank you. We will now, oh, Diane, did you want to say something? I just want to mention the other two people just to give another name. Oh, oh, yes. And uh, the other two people are in the audience right now. And one is Pat English. Would you please stand, Pat? And Don Tibbetts. And would you please stand, Don? Hey. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you. And, oh, um, yes. And I might say that they're both from United. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, yes, that was another thing that we said, you know, to have. Because, because we're all sitting up here from Third Mutual, and so it's really good to have two new members that will be uh, from the other housing mutual, United. Thanks, Annette, for saying that. Yes, a different perspective. Yes, OK. Thank you. We will now vote. It's unanimous, thank you. So we are now on 13C. Entertain a motion to approve the amended security patrol vehicle policy. Resolution 90, 18 X security patrol vehicles policy. Whereas the Golden Rain Foundation through the security department patrols <coughs> Sorry. Through the security department, patrols the community by way of marked security vehicles, bicycle patrol, and foot patrol. Whereas the board of directors of this corporation set forth a policy that all security patrol vehicles shall be limited to small pickup trucks. Now, therefore, be it resolved on November 6, 2018, that the board of directors of this corporation hereby approves the proposed revisions to the security patrol vehicles policy to include passenger vehicles and sports utility vehicles. And further resolved that resolution 9006-104 adopted November 7, 2006 is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of this corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. I second. Thank you. Discussion? Yes. Bert. Yes, I wish to amend uh, this resolution to read where it is on the therefore be it resolved, where it says security patrol vehicle policy to include passenger vehicles and sports utility vehicles, to read security patrol vehicle policy to include energy efficient passenger vehicles and sports utility vehicles. Do we have energy efficient sports utility vehicles? There are, yeah. and there are more coming, and I would like to make this part of this resolution. Um, okay. At least I make a motion. I, move. I, move. I said I move. 
Okay. Okay. I'll second the motion he, he, so we can discuss it. Mm -hmm. he, oh, I want it uh, where it says security control patrol vehicles policy to include, and at that point, enter energy efficient passenger vehicles and sports utility vehicles. And I'll second his motion then. Okay. Annette. Okay, as you can see from this resolution, we are trying to correct something that has occurred already in the community. The resolution 906104, which was adopted November 7, 2006. Diane Phelps happened to notice that on this resolution, it was just limited to small pickup trucks. Now, we're in our community has already purchased, and there are small vehicles and there are SUVs riding around. Mm -hmm. And when we discussed this prior, Bert, we talked about the fact that this resolution, as it stands, does not say that it will not consider in the future energy efficient. But right now, it must allow the vehicles that we've already purchased and are already part of our team, which are the SUVs and the cars and other things. So we wanted to correct this, number one. But if you would like us to do that in consideration going forward, I, I don't see how this precludes it. The other thing that happens here is emergencies occur here, whether or not we have energy efficient ways to, you know, basically um, plug in our vehicles. So we have to be careful what we're going to consider here. Right now, I think the way it stands is great. And if, you know, because we have to allow, and it would be foolish of us not to allow the vehicles we've already purchased because they accommodate the tablets and everything else. Thank you. Right. And so, Annette and Joan, uh, the question from me would be, if we did insert the word energy, include energy efficient passenger vehicles, then that would negate the ones we already have. So that's no. what you're saying. No, why would it do so? Yes, We're we just passing this resolution okay. now. This is not the time. Uh, not, we can't affect what has already been. Yes, we but can. this resolution is coming into effect today. Yeah, this, I think, I, I think we have uh, Ray. You have to consider, Bert, the traffic units sit there and idle constantly. The others don't do that. And as a result of that, they may run out of electricity while they're idling. So Ray. please hear me. I would, I would like to, to say that the, if you're going to do that, there must be exceptions to the traffic units, the ones that are issuing tickets. Let me clarify. Oh, no, 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 I did not call <clears throat> on you. Wait, because Diane had her okay. hand up. We need to. Have, have order here, yes. I just want to say that we already have purchased two electric vehicles and four SUVs. So I just don't want to put the extra burden on staff to have to look, I mean, I'm sure that they do, but they I just do. don't want to tie their hands any more than we already do. So for me, I would, I would recommend against making the change only because on their own, they already have purchased two electric vehicles. Okay, now sure. go ahead. Ray, the electric vehicle uses no energy while it's sitting there, zero. So I think you gotta understand what electric vehicles are all about, okay? Zero energy when they idle, because they don't idle. They sit there and do not use any energy, and I think that's important. Okay, um, do we have someone, Pat, wants to speak on this? Uh, yes, I'd like to speak on this issue. I agree with what Annette and what Diane have said, and I think we should go with it exactly as it is. Otherwise, we're going to run into several problems. The one I can see immediately is that you say uh, include energy efficient passenger vehicles, but you don't say energy efficient sports utility vehicles. So that would assume that we could have the regular passenger vehicles would be energy <coughs> efficient, but the sports utility vehicles would not necessarily. I believe we should leave it exactly as it is. Thank you. Um. I think the, else. Okay, yeah. Bert, last, last I'm not just saying that the energy efficiency Here's applies to both passenger and SUV vehicles, as it's worded. Okay, thank you. I know Siobhan's got something to say. Bert, I'd like to clarify, you're not eliminating it to electric vehicles. You're simply saying energy efficient vehicles. So there could be gasoline, dual fuel. You're not limiting them just to electric vehicles. That is correct. <clears throat> Joan. I'd like to propose an amendment to the amendment. <laughs> we, I would like to say 
energy after policy to include energy efficient vehicles, comma, passenger vehicles and sports utility vehicles so that energy efficient could apply to either passenger or utility vehicles. Um, is there a second to that? Second. Judith? Now we vote on that one. That kind of covers all territory, huh? So now we are at the legislative challenge. What do we do? Okay, so first we vote on the amendment to the amendment. Correct. And um, so all in favor of the amendment to the amendment, which Joan will repeat. Okay. Under that... Uh, now, therefore, be it resolved after security patrol vehicles policy to include energy efficient vehicles, comma, passenger vehicles, and sports utility vehicles. Thank you. All those, um, just vote, please. <laughs> We're going to do it by hand. Uh, do it by hand. Oh, it's new, so we do it by hand? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Raise your hand if you agree with this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. And disagree. Two. Okay. Motion passes. The amendment, the amendment. amendment. The amendment to the amendment passes. And the amendment. Now. See, Maxine, what is this? Number two? Uh, 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 okay, no. so now we're on to birth. The amendment has been amended, amended, so you don't need to vote on it. Oh, amendment. the amendment no. has been amended, so we do not need to vote on it. So now we vote on the resolution as amended. So now we vote on the resolution amended. as amended. On the amended resolution. On the amended resolution. We are now voting, and we can use our stylus for that. Yes, the motion passes. Dick, did you want to say something? Yeah, I would just like to ask one question. I thought that the vehicle department were already ordered to, uh, <coughs> to purchase electric vehicles. Did you want to address this that? This is just clarification. This is just a clarification. So this is, is redundant then. I'm just saying that. Oh, go ahead, Annette. The whole purpose of this resolution was to allow them to purchase passenger vehicles and sports utility vehicles because the original resolution that was passed on November 7th of 2006 only allowed them to, it was limited to small pickup trucks. No, I understand. All right, that. and that's why we brought the resolution today. And what happened was it was amended to include the energy efficient vehicles. <laughs> But my question still remains. I thought they were ordered to only uh, um, hire electric or buy electric vehicles. Not only. Oh, Siobhan. Siobhan, do you? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer, but I can research that and get back to the board. Okay. I think it's not not only, but the ability to, but not only electric vehicles. I think right. that's, that's, what I said. that's the way it is. But Siobhan will double check on that for us. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on. That's 13D, entertain a motion to form an investment task force, 13D. Resolution 90-18XX, investment task force. Whereas various committee and board members have expressed a desire to perform an in-depth review of Laguna Woods Village investment portfolios. Now, therefore, be it resolved, November 6, 2018, the Board of Directors hereby forms an investment task force and assigns the duties and responsibilities as follows. Mission, the purpose of the investment task force is to conduct an in-depth analysis of investments on behalf of the Golden Rain Foundation, United Laguna Woods Mutual, and Third Laguna Hills Mutual to ensure exceptional service from a professional investment manager, maximize yields within the board-approved investment policies, and minimize fees. 
membership. The investment task force shall be comprised of six members, one officer from each of the boards of directors and one at-large member selected by each of the boards of directors to represent each corporation based on their investment or financial expertise. The at-large members will be owners and may or may not currently serve as board members or committee advisors. Duties and responsibilities. One, the task force members will appoint a chair and meet as often as determined necessary to accomplish the objectives. Two, the task force will study the history of investment strategies used in the community, understand current investment policies, examine existing service agreements with Merrill Lynch and related fees from BlackRock for professional investment services, review current investment portfolios and evaluate yields. Three, the task force will review a draft RFP and propose, proposers list used by staff to solicit proposals from investment management firms for account services. Several qualified bidders will be asked to make a presentation to the GRF Finance Committee. Resolve further, the task force shall perform such other duties as may be assigned by the GRF Finance Committee during this assignment. Resolve further, the investment task force will be automatically disbanded upon conclusion of the duties and responsibilities assigned herein or when directed by the board. I move we approve this resolution. That second, Diane. I'll second it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diane. Discussion, Diane. So this came up um, at our finance meeting. Um, we just thought it was time to just look and see what was out there, and there are a number of people that are interested um, in taking in, in taking getting a deeper dive into our um, our portfolio. But uh, and I just wanted to add that if this is well, if this is approved, I, I have a tentative meeting date set up, so I'll announce that later. How's that? Okay. Sure. Yeah, I think it's important uh, for people to know that our return on investment over the last period was negative. And I, I think we have to, have to seek other ways of improving our investments. Uh, one of the things that I claim is that one of our best investments would be to provide for uh, generation of energy in this community, which has the potential of delivering a significant return on our investment. Diane. It's a little misleading to say that it's negative. The reason that it's negative is that we are holding some um, like treasury bills that, that have gone down in value because the interest rates have gone up. But that doesn't mean that if we hold them forever, we won't get the return that we were, uh, we, that, you know, that's stated. So it isn't that we've really lost any money unless we were going to try to sell them. Yeah, but, but I would still say the comparison to the return that we're getting and expect to get is really relatively insignificant compared to the potential that we would have if we were looking at energy. And the only other thing I was going to mention is that when you try to compare what we're getting, um, what the different mutuals as well as GRF are getting, um, the, the rate, we don't own stock. And so you need to compare this to what you're getting from your bank or from a CD rate, that that's really, that's how safe the money is, the safety, how safe the investments are. There are some bonds, but. There's, good clarification. There's nothing safer. Yes, sir, I mean, hold on, raise yeah. your hand. Okay, um, but there's nothing safer than an investment in capital equipment in our community. And that was your hand up. I just wanted to say that all of us as directors or fiduciaries, not to lose a penny of anyone's money. That is our primary concern. And we take that task very, very seriously. And you know, everybody's money is being watched very carefully, and we have it. And we're abiding by all the rules we're supposed to. We just didn't make up the formulas for this. There are certain things we have to do. There are certain areas that we can invest in, and it's all according to law, and we're abiding by it. And all we're trying to do is see if there is uh, presentations that were, we might end up with using the same people that we've already trying to do, but right now we're just looking at the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. 
Rana. I just go ahead, Rana. Okay, I just wondered why mutual fifty was excluded. We have our own investments. That's true, but I would assume Third and United have their individual ones because we are part of GRF. But when we had our um, our meeting and we had uh, BlackRock uh, Merrill Lynch come out, they didn't give us your portfolio information. You keep that separate. We did have that. You had it, but you didn't have it with us. Okay. And so um, I don't know that we're opposed to sh to, uh, to allow to like including you in this. But that would mean that we would look at your portfolio, and and currently we don't look at your portfolio. Okay. That was all. Thank but, you. And we certainly, so the idea is that this is going to, whatever they come up with is going to be presented at back to the uh, finance committee um, and to anyone that wants to attend it because they're always open. But, and so for sure you'd get the information, but. Thank you. If you want to participate. We need a little clarification, Rhino. So in light of what Diane said, would you want to be included in this? We'd have to make an amendment to this motion to include you. Oh, okay. So, so, so the answer is no at this time, right? Pardon? We can accept this one. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate what Annette just said that we have a fiduciary duty to our members uh, to protect our assets. And I'd also like to say that one of our main concerns in protecting our assets is we must always rely on our experts. And our experts in this case are BlackRock and Merrill Lynch. And to be pulling out another group of investment expertise, I, I don't know where these people are coming from. I guess they're coming from the community. But that would not make them experts. Thank you. Diane. They're just get. They're just looking at it to get a little more information. And this is in, in no way saying that we aren't happy with BlackRock or Merrill Lynch. Um, it was just. It seemed it had been a while, and that someone should look at it and just like review the policy and also uh, right look look a little more at the portfolio. Kind of like fresh eyes looking at it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Maxine McIntosh, sixty-eight C. I too am a little concerned about. The fresh eyes was something this important, something this important to all the boards. <clears throat> Through the years, when uh, boards have wanted to uh, modify their representatives, change companies, whatever, we always had staff, qualified staff, bring this information to us, bring a selection of people or companies or choices. Are we short of staff? Are we short of the professional staff? Because I really feel they should be handling this. Thank you. So Betty will be on this committee, um, or, and uh, just so you know, the peop it really is coming from uh, third, third Mutual in particular. Um, the person that, they're, that they've already um, assigned, assuming it, it gets going, is a guy by the name of Michael Cunningham, who's, who is their representative to the Select Audit Task Force. And then they also have uh, Jack Conley, who is their um, treasurer. And then um, for United, I believe the names I've heard were uh, Gary Morrison, who's the, who's their um, uh, treasurer, as well as um, Steve Leonard. You know Steve Leonard, um, and who we are considering is that I would myself, as well as Diane Casey, who is a f director. I'm sorry, is a, an advisor on our finance committee, uh, with Greg uh, Crigliano being her alternate. But so it's not. And again, they're not making any decisions. They're just assisting in it. Uh, the briefing um, I went to where uh, Betty gave a little report, um, the words that we use that BlackRock and Merrill Lynch have been very passive in our investments and that it wouldn't hurt to look at someone who will be more proactive in our investments. And I think that's what we're looking at is to get a more proactive group on our part. Yeah. One, one of the main reasons for switching from PCM to VMSI was the way monies were being handled by PCM. Those monies, as I recall, well, I'm pretty sure, did not include in the, the investment area. So I'm all in favor 
of this type of a thing. And, and, and the people that um, are assigned to this area should be um, brought up to date on some of the problems of this money handling in the PCM area. Okay. You know, when I, I think about it, conservatism is a pretty good thing because that wants to protect you. If you get somebody else in there that's gung-ho, I think you might try to look at that. That may be kind of, in my opinion, that's, that's kind of a bad advice because they want to do for them. And they figure they'll use you, but all of a sudden you got bum, 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 bum. You get loses, uh, losses as a result of it. So w with me, uh, the people I work with, and I've had them for about 22 years now, uh, they're conservative. They're looking out for me and them at the same time, not going gung-ho and going crazy. Um, just so nobody gets worried, we do have a policy that we are very conservative. And again, the group is just going to help, um, like just give some input into which, um, which firms the, might, might come and make a presentation to the Finance Committee. Um, so, and it's possible that we'll stay with BlackRock Merrill Lynch. It wasn't that there was anything that we think was wrong. We just thought it was time. And occasionally, this is what we do when we look. And then you confirm who you have, or you decide that there's somebody else, somewhere else you want to go. But in either way, if there's any change to be made to our investment policy for GRF, it would need to be changed by the GRF board. And the same with United and Third. I'm under, I was underneath the thinking, and I still think that this is correct, that basically, what this group is going to do is just review because Betty needs some help. Betty will still be the person that puts it out almost to bid to get some people that would respond like future experts. Let's just, I'll just throw this out there, like Fidelity or Vanguard or someone else. So what they're trying to do in essence is with Betty being there is say what kind of language, what are they specifically looking for, what do they like, what they don't like. And as I said, when they put it out to bid, BlackRock will be able to bid on it again or whatever. But now they figured out what it is, you know, that they liked, that they didn't like, whatever. As I said, you know, it could still end up being BlackRock. Thank you. I think we should realize United and Third have invested in solar. And they're getting a return anywhere from 8 to 10% per year on that investment. And that beats anything that we have gotten uh, in our investments to date. So that's a consideration that I keep on saying. We really should be looking toward uh, energy generation as a means of really putting our money to work. Good ideas, but that's, that's off topic at this time. Anybody else on the board? Well, Jim. I'm wondering uh, who's going to pick the people as credentials. We can say, you know, Johnny, Susie, all these people, you're on that board. And uh, we don't know what their background is. And can they do what we are anticipating uh, being do? Again, all three of the treasurers will be on it. And then Steve Leonard, we know. Um, and the other two, those of us, uh, like Michael Cunningham, like I say, he's on the Select Audit Task Force um, for um, United. No, for Third. Um, yeah, and he um, actually no, I think he's for GRF. So he should be a name that we know. Um, and then Diane Casey is on our. Um, but but again, all they're doing is uh, they're just uh, helping with with getting this RFP together and getting it out, and then um, looking. Just, they're just weighing in is all. Um, like I say, in essence, it boils down to three additional people, uh, one of whom is already on our, um, on our finance committee and as an advisor. The other is Steve Leonard that we all know uh, was a United board member. Um, and so the only one that you may be not be as familiar with is Michael Cunningham. Right. My only concern is that if we invite these other folks in, that means that BlockRock will have to decide do you trust me or not? And they may not even be involved with the same one. Say, okay, you don't trust us, you take those people. 
That is my concern, and, and it can be that way, but I'm not sure. This has been an interesting conversation, but all staff with the support of the boards are, is trying to do is their due diligence. Periodically, you need to go back out to the market, see what is available, make sure we're getting the best services that we possibly can get. <clears throat> Issuing an RFP is a normal procedure that all entities do from time to time, and this is just a prudent, prudent way to approach this. My turn. <clears throat> I just have, <clears throat> I support this task force. However, I have problems with a couple of words in your resolution. Uh, first of all, if you'll see on the little screen, it says entertain a motion to form an investment task force. I don't believe that GRF is forming. I would change the words <clears throat> in the now for there <clears throat> be it resolved uh, that the board of directors confirms participation in the inter uh, investment task force. Uh, GRF is not in charge. In the membership, uh, it does say two members from each of those three mutuals, but I also believe that uh, Petty should be on that task force. So I need to watch, watch the words that are in this particular one because this makes it sound like it's a GRF task force that the other mutuals are participating in, and it's a joint, everybody's participating. Just, to, just <coughs> in terms of governance, it's falling under the, um, or it's reporting to the GRF Finance Committee, and that's why. And it, the United Trust uh, Finance Committee, and the third Finance Committee. But all of them will come to the GRF Finance Meeting. I don't know if um, all of the advisors are gonna all go to each of the, of the, Finance meeting. Just the treasurers can make the report. Right. But uh, it's not through GRF, it's not a GRF committee or task force. In my opinion. Very good point. But in which case, who is forming the task force? I mean, the treasurer. We did. Because somebody needs to. Otherwise, we have to get, it becomes a select task force, and we have to get. Um, all the paperwork passed by each of the boards that's exactly the same and all that. And so this is really just more like the Performing Arts Center um, ad hoc committee. It's just like that. It's just a group getting together to sort of perform a function. Siobhan, you want to weigh in? The key here is that it's a six-member task force, so no board has a dominant composition of the task force. Exactly. So you are not forming Right, but somebody has to form it, so that's why we're forming it, because we're forming it out of the <coughs> Finance Committee. I, I support Juanita's comments, because I think this is jointly being formed. We did that for the Energy Task Force, and this is no different. It is different. It is different. It is different. It is. It's reporting back to the GRF Finance Committee. It's this also is. reporting back to the Third Mutual Finance Committee, and reporting back to United's Finance Committee. <laughs> But not the entire, okay, so the idea is that we put it together, well. Each, each of these HOAs and ourselves okay, have reserve accounts. We have money that's set aside, okay, and each of us therefore need to have this information brought back to the respective boards. <clears throat> and we each have separate investment policies. Right. Siobhan. If you read item, th item three in the resolution, it talks about the several qualified, qualified bidders will be asked to make a presentation to the GRF Finance Committee. Is this, uh, <laughs> we see, sit here and we're talking, I'm wondering, should we send this back and bring it to us? the next time uh, because we are not in, you know, uh, I don't see that how the vote will go. They, Diane. I can just say that they have been waiting on us to please do this because everyone else ha is much further along in, in, in what, like I say, they pick people. Yeah. Um, Maybe we formed it. 
So they're waiting for us to do the paperwork so that we can That's just governance-wise get it formed. They want to start working on it. And they meaning who? They meaning uh, like Michael Cunningham and Steve Leonard, and for us it would be Diane Casey, right. in that. addition to the three meeting. treasurers. But not the other mutuals, haven't asked. No, oh. the other mutuals, uh, this came up, um, I think the, the push was, it came out of a president's meeting. And it was, um, it was a, okay. So yeah, so the mutuals, in, in particular third mutual, I'd say, I, I can't speak for United. I was talking to Steve Parson. Okay. Ever since the last, when, it, when did they come? In August, I think. So we just have decided, you know, this is, we, we just have only, we had to wait till October when we met. We're done. Beth. So we had to wait so we could form our committee. Beth. Okay. Um, We're done. I'm going yeah. to ask one more time, Bert, this is your last, yeah. and then John. Uh, I think Jim's recommendation is very good. I, I would say that what we should do is take a look at the resolutions that have been already worked on by Third and United, incorporate that into the changes that we are making in our resolution. We can certainly call a special meeting uh, of this board uh, for a brief period of time, whether it be when we discuss our agenda and address uh, voting on this. I second your motion. What? I need a motion. Did motion. you make a motion? He's so just oh, discussing. Okay. I, I just. I, no, was that it's a motion? discussion right now. No, he was just discussing. We're just discussing, and it's not a motion right now. And I saw Diane's hand up again. I would just say, your energy committee is not addressing a single task and doesn't have a limited life. This has a limited life. It's just trying to get the RFP out. That's all they're doing. And it's an issue. So our paperwork, all this paperwork, it's holding it up. They just want us to form the committee. Uh, actually, it's an ad, the ad hoc uh, task force out of the GRF <coughs> Finance Committee. Okay. It's just for a single task, and then it will be Sense. done. Chuck. I totally agree with Diane. When you have an ad hoc committee like this, or a task force formed out of a, an existing GRF committee, which is the finance committee in this case, it is their prerogative to form this task force. And it doesn't matter, they're going to report back to the task force. The task force will then report to all of the mutuals the results of this, of this work. It doesn't make sense to me to say it has to be formed by third or United or GRF. It's not that kind of a, of a task force. It's very simple. It just has one thing to do and to get out of the work and get it done. Otherwise, we're not going to get it done if we have to go back and form something else. It's not necessary, guys. Really, trust us. It's not something that they're trying to pull the wool over Third or United. In fact, Third has requested that we go ahead with something like but this. United, through our treasurers. Your treasurer has been involved in this. Right. All right. It's not so. The GRF Excuse um, me. It uh, is the GRF task force because it comes out of the GRF Finance Committee. And our finance committee and third finance committee, we all have our own investment. It's a representative thing. Um, okay. Um, we need to vote on we, this. We need to stop this discussion and vote. So would you please repeat the motion, Joan? Okay. The motion is November 6, uh, be, it, be it resolved that the board on uh, November 6, 2018, the board of directors hereby forms an investment task force and assigns the duties and responsibilities as follows. And I'm not going to reread the, the mission, the membership, and the duties, but the main duty is to, uh, to help uh, staff form an RFP, Diane, correct me, an RFP for uh, investment management firms to come in and present their services. Okay, that's that it. it. That's it. Okay, um, that's the motion, and the motion was made and and seconded, and so now we will vote. Okay, the motion passes.
questions? Okay, we are going to move to 13D. E. Oh, E. E, E, excuse me. Entertain a motion to adopt illegal dumping reward program. 13E. Resolution 90-18XX, Illegal Dumping Reward Program. Whereas, Laguna Woods Village, through the city of Laguna Woods, contracts with waste management services for the disposal of bulky trash items. And whereas illegal dumping of bulky trash items is an ongoing problem throughout the village, and a majority of these incidents are not immediately reported. And whereas local authorities have been successful in gaining greater citizen involvement by offering rewards for reported specific violations or crimes. Now therefore be it resolved on November 6, 2018, that the board of directors of this corporation hereby approves an illegal dumping reward program with the following guidelines. One, reward is only valid for illegal dumping violations within the village. Two, callers are eligible for a $100 reward. Three, callers must con contact the security department to report the illegal dumping incident. Four, callers have the option to remain anonymous. A number will be issued to track the reward process. Five, information from the caller must result in positive identification of the suspect with a resulting monetary penalty administered through the mutual's disciplinary process. And six, VMS employees are not eligible. Resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of this corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. I'll second. I'll second. I'll second. Discussion. Clear, clarification. Yeah. Why isn't Annette's this? Annette's hand was first oh, okay. and then you, Bert. Okay. Okay. Um, perhaps, you know, security was trying to find a way that we could get more illegal dumping, you know, violations cited because we're finding out that most people don't like to report them. And this is a really terrible problem. I think it's mostly occurring in United. And people are just really, you know, up in arms about it. Now, sometimes when they do call in, and, you know, sometimes security doesn't come right there because security is responding to other incidents that have a higher priority such as, <clears throat> I won't even go into those things. Uh, basically, so what we're trying to do is, you know, figure out a way. I mean, the only other thing I could come up with was perhaps, you know, do you see the camera? Because it sees you, but I don't think that's a good one. Um, we just need to have more people, you know, give a shout out when they see something. And I understand that uh, not everybody's going to appreciate this or want this, but you know, it's it's an effort to try and get something done. Oh, Bert, I'm sorry, you next. I just need a clarification. Why is this our issue, not a HOA issue? The idea was that it was going to go to GRF first because we do have some trash cans, and then the policy to set like a general policy that would could be revised or whatever by by the mutuals. But because we do have we do have trash. And we've seen this illegal dumping in our trash cans. I don't know if we've seen it in oh, GRF. Yeah, yes, we have. We've seen considerable. As a matter of fact, when they opened RV up lot. the RV lot again, the first day they opened up that RV lot, within four hours we had to dump those containers twice. Okay, Because thank you. contractors and people were just coming in and just dumping all their junk. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. And because there was a camera there at the RV lot, they actually caught the dumper. Now, I would suggest rather than just this program, in my opinion, I think we need more cameras on the dump, the dumpsters that are available, especially in the three-story buildings where they can be hidden. Mm -hmm. But that would be my thinking. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Are the contractors who violate this thing are, are they being penalized? Is there a penalty? 
Yes, there are fi contractor fines. The mutuals have fines. I mean, yes, they, they do have fines and they are assessed a fee. I should just say that this did go to the, uh, it passed at the security uh, committee and when it came to us, um, our endorsement was to not, we did not recommend passing it because we're not sure of what the costs are of it. We're not sure if it, uh, it, it was just a little unclear to us how much this was, this was gonna cost to administer. Do we know how much it's costing us uh, not to administer it in terms of the dumping. What's costing us to oh, deal wow. with the dumping issue? I can comment on that. Um, I turn a lot of things into compliance, and so I think this isn't going to change their job much just to uh, issue a reward to someone because I call in all the time. I hate to be a whistleblower, but, you know, I respect this community, and I want people to respect the rules. So, um, in short, I think if we at least are saying there's a reward out there, people would know that someone's watching and that might give them incentive to follow the rules. So I'll, I'll be voting in favor of this. Siobhan, did you want to say something? Because no. I've heard it both ways, whether we do get, well, I'm not sure, I think they can charge us, I'm not sure that the, um, they have charged us, meaning the management. What we haven't been charged regularly for yet, but that is coming is contamination of the different types of bins, but this is illegal dumping per se, all those mattresses and things that are dumped on the side of the road outside of dumpsters that we have to spend staff time to pick up. Okay. I believe Bert was asking, what is the cost to us when you have hazardous materials that have to be separated and put into specific situations? It's thousands and thousands of dollars. It's a tremendous cost to us, which is unnecessary. I, was when I, I, was I believe okay. that, Luce, um, that uh, Brad mm -hmm. said that in order to, we have extra trucks that come along to pick up all of the bokeh, mm -hmm. they had to have two people on board at a staff, and of course the benefits of, it comes to over $100,000 a year. Yeah. When I was on third, um, we were paying $25 per incident, and that's where you get those hundreds of thousands of dollars from. Every time they went around and... Um, the trash vendor uh, found things that were not authorized and they had to put them, send someone extra to go pick it up on trash day. It, they were charging us $25 per item and that's where the cost added. I'm just not sure, I'm against this. So I'm not sure that the $100 reward is the answer. I say that we need to put up cameras, more cameras and have them monitored. Just want to mention that camera installation does require um, connection to the, the system, and there isn't always a good connection available, depending on what the placement of these cameras. Something that was interesting to me was that employees would not participate in this. Your, your many, many eyes that are around here that see this are employee eyes. I mean, they, they see the stuff too, but I don't know that they would report it just for a reward. They would, it seems to me, they'd just be reporting it because they see it and they know it's wrong. And, well, I don't know whether the fact of getting a reward is a good or bad thing, but <laughs> there are a lot of people out there who have learned that see something, say something is really a good philosophy for this place and to prevent somebody that sees this and, and just has their little tablet, little phone handy and says uh, over here at 99C there's just suddenly a big pile of trash. And not only that, they would be seeing, for instance, if it's a contractor, they would be seeing that and noting that perhaps more quicker, number one, but but with more savvy than a resident. Anyway, just a thought.
Committee reports. Report of the Finance Committee, Director Phelps. Okay, Whitney. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is slide one. Through the reporting period of September 30th, 2018, total revenue for GRF was $32.7 million compared to expenses of $31.7 million, resulting in net revenue <coughs> of $993,000. Slide two. This chart shows activity and operations separate from reserves. After backing out depreciation, which is not funded through operations, we can see bottom line, we had an operating deficit of $573,000 through September. Slide three. When comparing these results to budget, GRF was worse than budget by $753,000. <clears> the most significant unfavorable variance was, attribute, was attributable to uh, legal fees, uh, $375,000. These were higher legal fees and arbitration services for labor issues. Um, and, and we did, uh, in October, the uh, GRF board appropriated a supplemental appropriation, or I'm sorry, approved a supplemental appropriation of $350,000 from the contingency fund to cover unbudgeted legal fees and uh, the transfer will be made, will, will be made. October, I'm sorry, outside services of $350,000. This was uh, due to broadband expenses, which were moved from the cable programming category. The variance was further <clears throat> furthered by more outside repairs for generators and vehicles and unbudgeted marketing programs. The trust facilities fee was lower. This is in, uh, in part to the change from $2,500 to $5,000. For the first quarter, um, there were a lot of sales that were reported at the $2,500 level. And also, um, resales are lower than they were last year, um, and they're 5% lower than budgeted. Um, let's see, there also was, there was, um, uh, utilities were unfavorable, unfavorable by 156,000, um, due to increased water costs, consumption is running 11% higher than forecast, and, um, in addition there was, we had a, uh, what were reported as a loss on a sale of two buses, uh, it was just a book loss because these were two obsolete buses that were sold at auction and weren't yet fully, uh, depreciated. But we did experience a favorable variance in broadband services where we had additional revenue of 264,000 more than budgeted. Um, interest income was higher than budgeted as was an employee compensation um, was $219,000 lower uh, than we had budgeted. So that's favorable. Slide four. <clears throat> On this pie chart, we show the non-assessment revenues received to date of $9.9 .9 million by category, starting with our largest revenue-generating operation, broadband services, followed by the trust facilities fee, golf operations, and so forth. These <coughs> revenues help keep our assessments down. <coughs> Slide five. Okay, expenses to date of $31.7 million are also shown on a pie chart, with our largest categories being compensation, cable TV, Utilities, insurance, professional and legal, and materials and supplies. Slide six. The reserve and contingency fund balances are, sh are shown on slide six. <coughs> Starting with the first column on the left, the funds show a combined ending balance of $28.2 million. Including, included in this total are contributions received this year through assessments of $19 per man or per month, as well as trust facilities fees and interest earnings. The second column shows the work in progress of $4.3 million, reflecting the amounts paid for projects that are not yet complete. And the third column represents the resulted adjusted fund balance of $23.8 million. Slide seven. In an effort to give you more meaningful information on GRF reserve expenditures, we, we added this slide, which is a summary of our detailed reserve expenditures report. Column one shows we had appropriations of just under $21 million, 
approved as of September 30, 2018. Included in this figure are all 2018 capital plan items and supplemental appropriations, as well as amounts approved in prior years that were carried over for completion. This figure will increase as GRF approves supplemental appropriations during the year. The second column reflects expenditures and is, in, and is titled incurred to date or what has been paid since the funding was approved. We can see that just under $9.4 million has been booked as of September 30th, 2018. This figure will increase during the year as expenditures are made. And the final column shows $10.9 million, the remaining encumbrances. This is the amount approved by the board that it is not, has, that is not yet spent for open projects. Uh, the only thing I would add to this is that um, there, there were additional appropriations uh, that in October for the from the contingency fund, um, the $350,000. So this isn't reflected in this um, uh, slide because this is only as of September 30th, 2018. So that's it for the slides. Um, I hope this information is helpful and I remind you much more detail um, is provided in the GRF Finance Committee meeting agenda package which are available online and at GRF Finance Committee meetings. Our next meeting is December 19th at 1.30 in the boardroom. And that's it for me. So in the absence of uh, Beth, Are I Are there any I questions? No questions. All right, uh, next committee me, uh, Mr. Matson, uh, be reporting on the maintenance to construction committee. <clears throat> at our last meeting, that was October the 10th, um, we did not have uh, much of an agenda, so we spent uh, a lot of time on the project log, which right now we have 21 items and um, had some really good discussions there. Also, uh, some of the uh, things that we worked on, um, our CEO uh, reported it on a lot of the things, like the uh, pickleball and paddle tennis courts. That's moving along really well. This uh, Saturday pouring of the concrete out there on top of that is a major milestone for that activity. And so once all that is, is, is done, we move on to other things um, that are a lot lighter. There's a lot of electrical work that needs to be done, things, uh, lighting installed, and, and uh, some of the final works in the individual courts, putting uh, the individual courts together and so forth. And the, um, let's see, the also, uh, um, Staff reported on the Clubhouse 2 Annex projects at in, interim uh, green space area. Um, all of the d loads and loads of nice soil have been brought in there, and the irrigation has been put in there, and we now have grass, nice green grass growing there. The, um, some of the uh, picnic tables and, and uh, seating, uh, has been ordered. It's supposed to uh, a little late on getting that, but it's due any date now. <clears throat> uh, GRF paving and seal code program and, and concrete repairs, that's a significant activity. Um, a total of 1,106,000 uh, square feet of pavement area have been completed this year. Asphalt program consisted of uh, 251,000 square feet, and um, let's see, at uh, some of the new, these new gate arms that we're putting at gates, um, we're starting that, uh, we're, we're getting contractor bids on that, that's at gates 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, and 14. Um, Let's see, it was mentioned about the uh, HVAC system here at the community center, and uh, they're going to be putting a, um, the air conditioning unit up on top of our third floor here on the roof, and that's, um, as it was stated, that's going to be done uh, uh, Saturday during the evening. And so it's during nighttime, they'll have the, all the work 
will be done on evenings or weekends, not to impact operations in our busy facility here. Our next meeting is going to be, uh, MSC meeting will be December the 12th. And that's uh, about all I have. Beth. Thank you, Jim. And the next under you, Jim, is the report of the Performing Arts Center mm -hmm. ad hoc committee, and that would be me. And we have not had a meeting as of yet. It's to be announced whenever the next meeting would be. And then under, under the MNC also with Jim is the report of the Village Energy Task Force, and that's Director Muldo. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were three very significant energy events that have occurred this past month worth reporting. Now, the first concerns a revolutionary new energy storage system called the Chiller that a group of uh, members, like Carl uh, Rendazzo from United, Steve Leonard, who's one of our advisors, Ernesto Munez and Guy West that attended a solar conference at Anaheim and came across this technology. And I'll talk about that. The second is a new development in microgrid technology, which we learned about when a group of us, including staff director um, Ernesto Munez, and several other members of the community visited the National Fuel Cell Research Center at the University of California, Irvine. And the third relates to a recent SEC announcement about providing more options on how added choices may affect our energy bills. So let me share these with you. First, the chiller. Chiller is an energy storage system developed to supplement air conditioning. Essentially, it is an ice machine that makes ice during off-peak periods when electricity costs less, and during, like during the night. Uh, or the, and uh, in the heat of the day, the period of high peak, peak charges, the system shuts down the air conditioning compressors using high energy, and rather uses the chillers to cool buildings to save energy costs. Uh, we were excited to find out that we could use that technology here, and that it has the potential of reducing even the size of air conditioners. But even more exciting is that there is an SCE program that enables us to get these chillers at no cost. Actually, SCE would provide uh, the chillers. They also will provide a structural engineer to evaluate buildings to assure that they can structurally support the chillers, and a 20-year maintenance and warranty, all at no cost. So we really are very much interested in this. Uh, the chiller company, which is called Ice Energy, has already been evaluating our air conditioning units, and we expect that they will be presenting findings at the next Energy Task Force meeting. Second event that came uh, out of our meetings to the National Fuel Cell Research Center at UCI was prompted by an increased number of power outages that we had been experiencing recently in the village and our need to find a reliable and efficient backup energy source in the case of a disaster. Uh, let's face it, uh, SCE's existing plan today is, oop, pardon me. Uh, SCE's existing plan, their, their transmission lines, uh, their transformers, are basically been out there for over 50 years. And just as we are experiencing maintenance problems, so are they. And so the reliability and availability of their equipment is just going downhill. And so we're essentially <laughs> getting the effects of this problem. Uh, the solution may be an improved microgrid. Uh, let me explain a bit about microgrids for solar in installations like we've installed in United and in third, okay, actually will go down when the grid goes down. They cannot stay up. So they're not there for the reliability and availability. They will not do that. Whereas the microgrid um, does provide for uninterrupted service. In essence, microgrids are energy sources that allow for independent operation from the grid. Uh, they call that islanding, okay? and. Uh, what is, with islanding, the generation units, such as solar or fuel cells, would support the full load demand. And not only would using them provide significant savings, but in the event of a failure, the microgrid could still switch to the utility source as backup. But meanwhile, we're generating our own electricity and saving all the money that we would be shelling out 
to the energy company, the resulting islanding operation increases the reliability and resil resiliency of the campus loads that are being uh, existing right now at UCI. They actually have something like 25 megawatts of generating capacity. Well, it's far more than we would need, but they're supporting a campus that has approximately 40,000 people. Okay, and they have a lot of scientific equipment and other things that demand this high energy demand. Uh, we would provide, or we would need probably a lot less than that. But still, is it, 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 our energy bills are rather significant as far as we're concerned. Okay. Um, so mem um, okay. So we have hired a consultant uh, to look into this microgrid for GRF. And uh, we expect to learn more from the consultant at our next energy meeting again. So that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, and that's, that's scheduled at 1.30 in the Willow Room. Third exciting event that affects energy here is that Southern California Edison recently announced that it would support customer choice with clean energy sources. Okay, SE has contracted with nine alternative clean energy providers who can contact to help us to find best alternatives to best manage our electricity usage and save money. Members also have an option to switch, by the way, and this is in the community, our members have an option to actually switch to an, a different energy provider. Uh, I'm aware of one energy aggregator that exists uh, that some members of our community have already availed themselves to. Uh, it's named Arcadia, who can provide alternative clean energy in place of the energy provided by SCE. And they do advertise on the internet. If you're interested, go on the internet and dial, you know, enter Arcadia and they are making an offer for this alternative source. So as you can see, there are a lot of exciting developments in the field of energy that will be affecting our community. And anyone that is interested in learning more can attend this Energy Task Force meeting Wednesday, November the 7th at 1.30 in the Willow Room. There'll be a presentation by Chilla Manufacturer, who's been analyzing HVAC, uh, as well as preliminary report from the energy consultant that we've hired, and we'll also hear from Siemens uh, regarding the planned replacement of the current SCE streetlights with community-owned LED streetlights. So you're all welcome to attend. That's my report. Thank you very much. Next report, we will be going back up to the Community Activities Committee, and that I will be reporting on that, and we did not have a meeting this month, so there's nothing to report, except I would like to say that this Saturday and Sunday, the Village Bonanza will be happening at Clubhouse 4. Please remember last, that. This was last weekend. Oh, I'm reading it wrong. Ah. It was great. It was great. <laughs> Somebody caught you in an error. <laughs> oh, just an, how many is that? I don't know how many is that. It's three. Oh, see. Woo. Um, however, it, it, with this, um, great brochure, there are many other things about movie night and Monday night football and the Thanksgiving buffet and yoga classes and whatnot. So be sure to pick up your November recreation events activity brochure. And the next meeting will be Thursday, this Thursday the 8th at 1.30 here in the boardroom for Community Activities Committee. Thank you. Now we will go to Media and Communications Committee, Director Millman. Okay, our last meeting was October 15th of uh, this month, or last month, whenever it was. <laughs> uh, several things came up. Um, Mr. Holland told us about contract renewals, analog channel removals, subscriber counts, and financials, and so on, the usual reports, which he does make very interesting, I must say. Um, but he brought up some other, one other interesting thing, and that is cable cards. I don't know how many of you remember that the old systems used a card that you would insert into your television or into a box, and these cards enabled you to get all kinds of channels. Well, we used to put those little cards into our boxes for nothing. And so these people that have these cards 
get all these channels for nothing. So now we're going to think about charging for the cards, and that's going to come up next month. Just want it, just a heads up. It's not that you're going to lose anything, but you're just going to have to pay for it. Um, also, I discussed possible removal of the old Channel 3 guide that you see rolling, rotating, scrolling, but that also is going to be discussed. It's not going to happen overnight, but just FYI. Uh, next month, he's going to have uh, suggested pricing, small price increase increases for uh, digital pay tier pricing, which will be explained at that time. And then uh, Ms. Uh, Pollan uh, reported on marketing or, and communications, which is called MARCOM. And one of the things that they've been doing uh, is to assist Third and United and us too in our year-end achievement PowerPoint presentations. And they're very fine presentations, I might say, because they are uh, lifted from Brad's original presentation, which was quite long, and uh, edited for our own use. So I'm looking forward to using that, hopefully, at our next meeting, which is coming up on the 14th. Um, between the year-end election presentations and uh, the October breeze and uh, the few things, many things that they had to get out are... Breeze has been delayed until November, so it's it's coming out shortly, if it isn't already out. Um, there are new real estate signs that have been developed by the our marketing group, and the real estate agents have decided they like the orange ones the best. Now, what about monitoring these signs? As you know, there are many different signs around the neighborhood, and they aren't all ours. So. We've invited, or Eileen was invited to go to the uh, security meeting and with the idea that people on security would also kind of look for those signs and monitor them. And you too can do that. When you see funny real estate signs, uh, we want you to report it because we're trying to make the village look the same. That's what it's all about. <laughs> So next month, uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, the policy for ph photography and filming within the village. And it's going to be on our agenda coming up in, the, in November on the 19th, I believe it is, at 1.30 in the, in the afternoon. This is our, our next meeting. But before that, you may have noticed some political canvassing around. That's permitted now. Uh, and so you may have seen some, some of that because of the new Proposition 4515. So we are open for political canvassing. Other than that, we meet next, uh, next as I say, Monday the 19th here at 1.30. That's my report. Thank you, Joan. Report of the Mobility and Vehicles Committee. Director Troutman. Okay, I was bringing up my mobility ad here. Okay, there was no scheduled meeting um, last month for m and but I wanted to give you a little history on the transportation services. In the early 60s, the management staff saw a need for residents to get to shopping areas. So they came up with what they called the accommodation bus. This was a bi-monthly um, excursion they charged $2 fee for a round trip ticket to Laren Square Market. Now $2 in the 60s, I used my little calculator to, uh, that was an inflation app. In 1966, a dollar was equal to $8 today. So that would have been $16. So we would have been charging for these trips. No, we are not charging you today for these excursions. Um, then they had, they wanted to go to the beach. And so in 1965, they charged a dollar round trip for an excursion to the beach. And they made two trips a day. And they called that the shopper special. Finally, in 1988, the transportation department was born with 18 buses and 15 security vehicles. Over the years, as the demographics in the community changed its needs, so did the transportation system, which we are still experiencing growing pains today. Uh, these neat little 
bits of information can be found on pages 53 and 54 in our anniversary book that you can purchase at the Historical Society. And one thing that's been very frustrating for staff over the years is it's that every fiscal year our boards change and so do the makeup of the committees. So new people come on and new, new changes are made and frequent, uh, f frequently staff is redirected in another direction after they've already spent time and money on a particular project. And it doesn't appear to be a very cost effective way to do business, but that's the way we've been governing for many, many years. So to relieve that frustration, um, it's been customary for committee chairs to meet with the incoming committee directors before the new physical year month, which for GRF is November. So since Third United and 50 had already had their elections and their committee members had already been picked, October was the perfect time to do just that. So it saves a lot of time and uh, wasted time in the first meetings of the physical year getting new members and directors up to speed on what staff has already been doing on that committee, what projects were already in place, and what ongoing issues are. So on October 30th, uh, we did just that. We had a, a little briefing with just the new committee members, and any GRF uh, directors were all invited. So, and we briefed on what was going on all year, where we are now, what the issues uh, that we've identified during the year, so now that they can start the physical year with some good background, um, which hopefully saves a lot of time and, and money in the long run. So we also reviewed three governing documents that give the M&V committee the power to act. And since one of these documents was in contract form, that briefing, according to Davis Sterling, had to be a closed meeting. So some of the residents are asking me why that debriefing wasn't open to the public, and it's because <coughs> or mandated otherwise. Um, I want to just read the news bulletin for a shopping uh, destination. Since I mentioned these free excursions, there was one today going to the Aliso Viejo Town Center. On the 13th, we're going to Orange Tree Square Shopping Center. On the 20th, they're going to Laguna Beach. The 27th, the Marketplace at Laguna Niguel, the Playa de la Plaza. And on the December 4th, to Mission Viejo Mall. So look forward to those. Uh, there's been a couple of minor changes. It used to be um, recently they were saying your baskets had to be 15 inches or smaller. Now that's just a recommended size. We are allowing the larger baskets on the bus. Uh, Monday, November 12th, I think Siobhan already mentioned this, is Veterans Day, Thursday, and November 22nd is Thanksgiving. The only bus service running will be the planner ride. Be sure to schedule your trips no later than two days prior to the holiday by noon. Please arrive five minutes prior to your pickup time. If you make a reservation and need to cancel, you call the tra uh, transportation office. So anyway, that's from the bulletin. And just don't forget, it used to be 24 hours. Now we've changed it. It's plan ride is actually so successful and we're always full. So we're requiring two days notice now to get a ride. And the next meeting for will be December 5th at 1.30 right here in the boardroom. And that concludes the M&V report. Thank you, Judith. Next is a report of the Security and Community Access Committee. Director Sebozol. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm going to read you something that was on November 3rd, the gate update email, which is called the village update. For those people that don't have email services, this is very important because this is on the condition of our gates. I know everybody's concerned about this. The gate update from Ernesto Munoz, Director of Maintenance and Const Construction, continue, as he continues to update the village on the installation of radio frequency identification, RFIDs, gate arms. Now remember, this year we have added gate 10 and the kiosk for ID swiping when you walk up versus just flash your Costco card, okay? Um, the proposal for the approval of all gate arms will be presented at the December GRF Maintenance and Construction Committee meeting, which is taking place on December the 12th at 9.30 here in the boardroom. Upon committee approval, the gate arms expenditure will be presented at the January GRF open board meeting. Following 
the, the board approval, the project will go out to bid with the expectation that the contract, we already had the vendor, will be awarded in 2019. Installation will begin after that and will be done on a schedule that will create the least amount of disruption to residents. So I think it's very important for you to know. The other thing I wanted to say was we did meet on October the 22nd, 1.30 here in the boardroom, and I stressed the importance of using Dwelling Live and the goal to drive as much traffic to the Laguna Woods website. I'm encouraging residents to start using Dwelling Live to enter their guests instead of calling the gate clearance system. Residents will need their guests first and last names and the vehicle license plate number if you're planning on having your guest um, overnight for a parking pass. The guests must also in turn have the resident's unit number, which means if your address is 12345, they need to know that you live at maybe 12345C if that's applicable. Um, that will make their time at the gate more efficient. I also wanted to mention that uh, we had the great uh, California shakeout here in the village, and that took place on October the 18th, 2018, and that was at 10, 18 p.m. The focus was on the care and reception centers, tabletop exercises, and that was very successful. The uh, Chief Moy, who attended our meeting on, and gave most of the reports on October 22nd, commented on the caregivers in the community and informed the committee that the caregiver policy is being modified. He explained that the changes will provide a more efficient process and encourage more caregivers to register. That was important. The other thing that's happening in the community is the ID cards, uh, member ID cards are changing from the card that we have now to what's called a proximity card. The cards we have now cost about 30 cents. The new proximity cards will cost about $5 to roll out. And the ID card replacements and resident services. Uh, my concern was Chuck Holland said he could do about, he's planning on doing 1,000 of these a year. It's basically gonna be new residents or somebody lost their card. And I wanted to know, and at the next meeting, we will find out um, if resident services could do about 500 a quarter. Because if they can, this task can be accomplished within five years at a cost of about $10,000. Um, currently, we have 16,500 residents in the community. And between um, what Chuck wants to do and what I'm proposing, it would be 15,000, and about 1,500 will fall to the wayside due to attrition. So we're gonna be speaking about that at our next meeting. And today we covered the illegal dumping rewards program. And then at the next meeting too, we're gonna to talk about the state bill 4515, which is political canvassing. Uh, we're also gonna bring that on. So I just want to say the biggest thing will be the member ID cards and getting back about doing a rollout on that. We'll also talk about smoke alarms and fire divert devices. And I believe that the next meeting is December the 16th, 17th, I think it is, at uh, 9.30 in the morning. We, we're not having it at our usual fourth Monday due to the fact that that would be uh, Christmas Eve. It will be the Monday before at 9.30 here in the boardroom. Thank you. Report of traffic hearings, Director Gross. Uh, yes, we had a traffic uh, uh, committee hearing on the uh, 17th of October. There were 13 uh, people attending. We found 12 of the individuals guilty and one individual not guilty. A in addition to that, there are 40 to 50 additional uh, notices of violation that people simply do not come to traffic hearings. They just go ahead and submit and pay the fine or whatever the case may be. Uh, so as a chair uh, director, I sign those off. And uh, it's every month it's that way. But we get an average of anywhere from 13 to 28 people uh, on the hearings if we have afternoon as well. Uh, our next uh, hearing will be November the 21st at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Disaster Preparedness Task Force Director Troutman. Okay, there was no meeting in October. However, we did participate in the statewide California shakeout 
on October 18th. The purpose of the exercise is to test a dynamic, multi-level disaster response plan that was developed cooperatively with the DPTF, BMS staff, City of Laguna Woods, and the Orange County Health Department to include local first responders. There are two major scenarios. There's a disaster and there's an incident. A disaster is defined as any natural or man-made catastrophic event that seriously threatens the safety and welfare of the residents in Laguna Woods and or results in the widespread damage of property, injuries to residents or employees, or seriously interrupts the normal activities within the village. An incident is defined as any natural or man-made event that can be a significant episode, but the event is more localized versus widespread in its impact to Laguna Woods Village community. In this event, a field command post would be activated. An example might have been uh, last year we had a shooting incident in United that involved the Gate 4 area, and a field command post was set up for that. An incident could always potentially evolve into or be upgraded to a disaster. During the exercise, we actually had residents pretend to be victims who were given a fake injury. The team practiced the triage and communication procedures with the first responders. So we had two debriefings the following week uh, for the exercise where TAF members, staff, and the VMS security all participated. Historical data proves that practicing your disaster plan regularly will prevent a poor use of resources, inappropriate practices and strategies, eliminate safety problems, increase efficiency, and lower incident and disaster costs. Our Laguna Woods Village disaster plan is based on the template from FINA that was developed in 1970. So uh, we had this neat little form here that we went through during the debriefing and we looked at areas like our clubhouse reception areas and um, everything from how the personnel uh, responded, what the room looked like, was this, the triage room, the quiet room and everything set up according to our plan. We looked at the communication between the volunteers, the VMS staff and the EOC uh, personnel. And then we looked at, uh, was all of our facilities being effective. And so uh, one of the things we did find, well, always we want to do these preparedness exercises because they identified our weak spots, uh, which in some cases were some lack of coordination, some miscommunication, so some potential safety hazards. And so, for example, one of these was the clubhouse coordinators when the building um, not building captains, but our good neighbor captains, bring their sheets of who's injured in their immediate area, and they bring that to the clubhouse coordinator. Then the coordinator gets on their radio and is supposed to pass that information on to their command center so they can get the first responders out to who needs it the most. Well, there was so much traffic on the radio the clubhouse coordinators at the care centers were not able to pass that information on because they couldn't get a word in edgewise. And that's one of, anyway, a potential safety and communication issue. So uh, our radio team is going to be working on that, the, our radio club at Clubhouse One, along with security to find out how we can solve those, maybe have a, a second uh, setting uh, or a link or something of that nature. So. Finding these weaklings is exactly why, why we need to have constant practice and exercise. And the task force would like to have at least another exercise of two a year in addition to the shakeout. Overall, um, it was a very successful drill, mostly because it called our attention to where our weak links were. So working together, we create a culture of preparedness. Thank you, that concludes the disaster. Thank you, Judith. Next is a report of the Landscape Committee, Director Muldow. Yeah, uh, I've been made well aware of the chemical problem and sprays uh, that are being used in the community. And uh, we have no choice right now. We're not meeting until December. Uh, actually, the meeting date will be December the 19th at 2.30 in the Sycamore Room. Uh, but in the interim, we're, we're waiting uh, the United Report 
And uh, I believe that's going to be at the next landscape meeting, which will be prior to that date. So we're hopeful that we'll get an answer to the problem. Uh, the other thing was that uh, I attended the third uh, mutual landscape meeting. And in that meeting, uh, Director uh, Bruce Hartley indicated that there was really good news coming with regard to the creek. And uh, so I immediately uh, emailed him asking him, what's the good news? And he's never responded. So <laughs> I, have, I have no news to report, um, unfortunately. And uh, that, that's basically it for the landscaping. <laughs> Thank you. We have no future agenda items here. And so now we are on item 16, director comments. And we're going to start with Director Palmer and go around. I'm fine, thank you. This was a good meeting and I just wanna say the next security meeting will be December 17th at 9.30. Just wanted to make that date clear, thank you. Thank you. I want to say, Judith, you will be sorely missed, and I want to wish you success in your attempt to, to get on the city council. Yeah, we'll all be watching tonight. <laughs> good luck. I'm sure you're going to get it. Uh, good meeting, Beth. <laughs> Compliments. Thank I didn't you. notice anything terribly wrong. <laughs> good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ray. Uh, just a little bit more in Laguna Canyon. Uh, uh, Coast Builders, we have nine pages, and they're up at the front desk. If you have any questions whatsoever, all you have to do is make a phone call. Uh, that would be 949-497-8324. There's tremendous activities here. Uh, the, there is a fee for parking, which is $3. Other than that, all of the other activities are just wide open, and they're fabulous. They have a whole bunch of these up front. I make sure that they're there all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Diane. Hi. Obviously, I can't speak to the obvious, but um, it's a very exciting day for me because I'm actually working the polls as an election integrity observer. And you work for the um, Register of Voters Office in Orange County. And I go out with, uh, started at 6.30 this morning, and I had three assignments and only made it to two because I had to come to this meeting. But after this meeting, I'll go and finish until 9.30 tonight. So, and... We watched, we just sit quietly in the corner. We don't interact, we're not allowed to interact with any voters. And we just make sure everything is according to regulations. If not, we have a little hotline we call, and we call the uh, ROV, and they will send someone out if there's an incident. And rarely do we have incidences here. We did have some this morning, <laughs> but I won't go into that. So anyway, it's been a very educational day, if nothing else. And I would just like to, um, say just one last few words. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered, but we forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish and ulterior motives, but be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies, but succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you, but be honest and sincere anyway. What you spent years creating, others could destroy overnight, but create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous, but be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten, but do good anyway. If the best, do the be give the best you have, and you will never, and it may never be enough, but give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It's never been between you and them anyway. This quote was found on the walls of Mother Teresa's children's home, Calcutta, India. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to serve. Jim. Mm -hmm. I would like to say, uh, Judith and I were in uh, uh, the third board for two or three, three years. years. And uh, she uh, was saving my backside by knowing all this kind of stuff. And um, anyway, we had, had a really good uh, uh, board over in third. 
And then when we came to here, uh, I still, and I sit, and this is always there. And also, uh, you jump into the different places where you have to have a secretariat for a day and all that kind of stuff. Plus, I don't know of anybody that would come to you and say, I need to talk. That you said, I don't have time. Thank, Thank you, Jim. I got up early this morning and voted, and I'm, you know, you're not supposed to mention names of people who vote for, but there is someone on this board that I voted for. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I would just like to reiterate that I've had the pleasure of working with Judith on the third board and on this board, and I thank you, Judith, for your contributions. You just really, really contributed a lot. Hard worker. We will truly miss you, and best luck in the future. And this meeting is adjourned. Recess. Recess. Recess.